We'll begin this morning with Mary Lou Ferrante. She's from Millbury, Massachusetts, born in Worcester. After high school, she studied guitar and she traveled across the country, visiting relatives en route. Mary Lou said she turned to the blues because she loved the arrangements that happened and also because she felt release when she performed them. She began performing at the Old Vienna Coffee House down the street in Westboro. And those were in the days back in the 1990s when Dar Williams and Ellis Paul would come over there and they would participate in open mic, just like everyone else. Since then, she's been performing out there in places like the Hat Shell in Boston and opening for musicians like Chris Smither. And she's called Bay State's finest female acoustic blues interpreter. Blues music is her passion, and she said that she's happiest sharing this passion with others. And Mary Lou said, this music speaks to my soul as well as the history of the folks and the difficult circumstances they endured. Guy Davis warns us all, Mary Lou is a killer. I have watched her grow, and now she's taking over. Blues lovers look out. Well, watch out, everyone here at HCAM, and please help me welcome Mary Lou Ferrante. I'd like to start by doing a tune by um, a wonderful Delta-style blues player. His name is Charlie Patton, and um, this is called Moon Going Down.
Thank you. This is a great audience. Early morning blues. <laughs> well, this next tune was really a jazz tune, and um, I first heard a wonderful blues woman sing this song. Her name was Joanne Kelly, and um, I, I believe she died in 2000. She was really wonderful. She, she sort of paved the way for folks like Rory Block and Bonnie Wright, and she knew the Chally Patton and the Sun House. She could sing those styles and play them. Uh, this is called Easy Street. Well, I'd like to do a, a song that was actually oh, this one shows Cape of Fire in there. Um, was written by a blues woman. Her name was um, Lottie Kimbrough. She also was known, I think, as Lena Kimbrough or, and Lena Beeman. I think Beeman might have been her married name. And, but she had a great nickname. These people had some great names. 
<laughs> and her name was Kansas City Butterball. <laughs> I think she played with the Kansas City Rollers, too. That was part of where it all came from. And I guess she was a rather... She was a rather large woman, and um, she had a very attractive sister that they actually took photos of and used it for her press. <laughs> you could get away with that in the 20s and 30s, for sure. Such a great story. But this is her song. It's called Rolling Long. drift no more cause I've been rolling drifting along that road I'm looking looking for my room and boy like a log I've been cast on the bank while I'm so hungry I feel a lean and lame get me a pig and shovel dig it down Keep on digging, digging till my blues come down. Oh, won't you dig down, won't you dig down those blues? Thank you. Thanks so much. This is great to have such a great audience so early in the morning. <laughs> I work at Starbucks, so I know what early is. We actually like open at 5.30. This next song was written by a wonderful blues um, um, performer and songwriter and uh, artist. His name is Guy Davis and um, he writes blues, he writes the songs just like the old guys did. Um, in fact, this particular song he said he stole a line from like Bessie Smith and Charlie Patton and Tommy Johnson and he just put it all together. This is called Long As You Get It Done.
getting good loving Now you want to come home again It doesn't matter how you do it Just as long as you get it done And I sharpened all my razor Loaded on my gun Caught you if you stand Shoot you if you run You know I'll cut you if you stand Shoot you if you run It doesn't matter how you do it Just as long as you get it done Mississippi River, long, deep, and wide. Oh, I see my good man standing over on the other side. You know, I see my good man standing over on the other side. It doesn't matter how you do it, just as long as you get it done. Cause I don't care where you go, babe. I don't care where you've been. Why the road to take you out, bring it back home again. You know that road that take you out, only bring it back home again. It doesn't matter how you do it, just as long as you get it done. Saddle my black man Will I find me my good man Out in the world somewhere You know I'll find me that good man Out in the world somewhere It doesn't matter how you do it Just as long as you get it done Thank you Probably have like time for two more, maybe. Um, I think I'll do a, something a little more, uh, not really blues tune. This is a song that was written by uh, Lucinda Williams and uh, it's off one of her CDs that I absolutely love. She's such a great songwriter. It's called um, Car Wheels on a Gravel Road, and uh, so many great tunes on that CD. But one day I was trying to figure out, um, trying to play a tune that, oh, trying to trying to work out an arrangement in uh, double drop D, and so this is what I came up with. If you 
come across it Let me know if I let it fall along a back road somewhere Cause money can't replace it And no memory will erase it Oh, I know I'm never gonna find another one to compare to me oh, everything's paid for nothing's free if i give my heart away promise not to break it because i think i lost it let me know if you come across it let me know if i let it fall along a back road somewhere Money can't replace it, and no memory will erase it. Oh, I know I'm never gonna find another one to compare. Cause money can't replace it, and no memory will erase it. Oh, I know I'm never gonna find another one to compare. And with a song by um, written by another great Delta bluesman, his name was Tommy Johnson. I just got to read to him. And Tommy Johnson, um, not to be confused with Robert Johnson, they were not re related. But he is actually the first one that came up with the story about going to the crossroads and selling his soul to the devil, and that's how he became such a great guitar player. <laughs> but then Robert Johnson loved that story so much that he took it, and he's sort of famous for that. What, 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 what was so cool about Robert Johnson is he hung around as a young kid with, um, he tried to hang around with Charlie Patton and Tommy Johnson and Sun House, and he was sort of... Um, he didn't really know how to play guitar yet. He was a harmonica player, and um, they just kind of were like they kind of told him to go go learn how to play guitar. <laughs> and so he he left for like a year. I don't know. So the story goes, and he learned how to play guitar. But he had the benefit of listening to all these recordings in those days, where the old guys, the first guys you know, Sun House, Charlie Patton, all them, they didn't have the benefit of listening to all these different recordings. And and um, Robert Johnson got to listen to all these different fellows, not just from the ones from his area. And so that's why, you know, he just, you know, took off with the blues. And, um, and they say, like, before rock and roll, there was Robert Johnson. But this was a song that was written by Tommy Johnson, and it's called um, Bye Bye Blues. Thank you so much for having me.
Thank you. The poem I have this morning is about autumn. It's called Autumn Gifts. Autumn's equidistant dance, circling batons of light and dark, initiate great mystery, dark, 
deep, holy. Beneath humdrum, spirit rises, lighting daring, unimaginable paths. Knowing grows, hope emerges. Leaves blaze in glorious colors, then wither and die. Nature's truths run deep. The dead dance at November's chill. Spirits rise in joy. We all shake hands with the unseen. Autumn's mysterious gifts bring surprise, inner strength, knowing, hope, thankfulness for cornucopia of the spirit. Happy autumn. I have two poems. Steam heat. He came to steam the carpets clean one sultry summer morn. His rugged face was handsome and his cut-off jeans were torn. He'd parked his truck behind my car, allowing no escape. My heart began to flutter and my sentiments went ape. He hauled in the machinery, the hoses, brushes, soap. He said it wouldn't take that long, which somewhat dashed the hope <laughs> that he would stay on for a while. My heart then skipped a beat and raised my body temperature as high as that steam heat. <clears throat> I began writing poetry when my husband died, and he died, uh, tomorrow's the anniversary of his death. He died in 1997, so it's been 12 years. I'm gonna read a poem off the page, which means I'm gonna try not to look at the book, uh, that I, it's my, one of my favorite poems about him, I guess. He called me princess, but he didn't mean one who wore a royal family tiara, or one in a fairy tale with a fancy dress and a magic wand. No, what he meant was less obvious, but more telling of our relationship. When he called me princess, he could make the name sing with tenderness, as if I were the only woman on the face of the earth. Most times for him, I think I was. Most times I needed to count on that. He called me princess with aplomb if he wanted to defer to my judgment, or plaintively if he had reached the end of his rope and wanted me to make the decision. We trusted each other like that. He called me princess with an edge to his voice if I was trying to get my own way and he thought I didn't deserve it. He called me princess in exasperation when I wore him down in arguments that could have gone either way. I was really good at that. He called me princess with the barest hint of irony, knowing full well that I did not lead the life of a princess, but that we are often kidding ourselves in life after all. It's the way many of us get by. Perspective colors everything. We had one of our best laughs when we learned that this guy in work had a dog named princess. Nice company I was keeping. and that. Thursday night in the hospital with those raging leukemia cells, poised for what turned out to be the final blow, his last words to me had been, I love you, princess. You look tired. Go home and sleep. Although I never said it to him in so many words, I knew I had married a prince. Thank you. I wrote this song a couple of summers ago after my, my dog, who is a pacifist <laughs> and vegetarian, was caught chasing the neighbor's chickens. <laughs> when the sun rises up over Peabody Hill, hear the first morning sound coffee ground in the mill. A little fire in the valiant will take off the chill. There is peace here on Peabody Hill. My dog in the corner, his tone is contrite. He tells me he'll bark, but he never would bite. He was caught chasing chickens and the farmer's goodwill still there's peace here on Peabody Hill when the sun rises up over Peabody Hill hear the birds and the kids they twiddle and trill and spill out of their nests their bellies to fill there is peace here on peabody hill 
The kids play Skittles, they roll on the rug, pick their blueberries, chase back in by bugs, drop the berries in batter that we pour on the grill, peace and pancakes on Peabody Hill. The sun rises up over Peabody Hill. I'm wanting for nothing, convenience nor frill. The hum of cicadas is my sleeping pill. There is peace here on Peabody Hill. I'm still in my pajamas. The world has slowed down. No cell phone. No email. I left them in town. Just the breath of the breeze in the trees breaks the still of the peace here on Peabody Hill. There is peace, peace, peace on Peabody Hill. Just to give you a little insight, I know I got three to four minutes, but I grew up in Cambridge, Mass, and my biggest claim to fame is that I graduated with Matt Damon. So I'm name dropping. He's doing much better than I am, but hey. Um, I've been writing for 20 years, and I just recently put out a book, a collection of poetry. There's bookmarks in the back, pick it up. You know, so, um, so I'm going to read something from that book. It's called Purification, Cleansing of the Contaminated Soul. I'm also working on another one that's called You Can't Get Inside My Head. It's already overcrowded, so I'm going to read something from that. The first one I'd like to read and share with you is called Grasping for Life. A child sobs in a broken crib that sits in the corner near an open window, the mother losing her patience, drinking softly from a bottle that soaks up her thoughts. No one nearby to watch and keep safe. The wind is blowing the empty cupboards back and forth. The fragrance of freshly sprayed glade covers up the deathly aroma. Cigarettes burning one after another in an ash-filled bin. Sirens from the outside are the only source of music. The three-room apartment, cluttered with emptiness. The kettle whistling, blending in with the cry. No incentive. Thank you. The second one I thought would be appropriate since it's being taped. This one's called Life on TV. My writing varies depending on mood, as we all know. Uh, I seldom watch the news, but when I do, I turn on the TV to see stories of an elephant trapped in a manhole, scandals involving politicians and their extracurricular activities, the woes of reality TV stars, and yet another actor running for some sort of seat in office. What happened to all the insanity in the world? It cannot be that we have all gone sane and started writing poetry. Thank you. This is a tale of being short. Warehouse box department stores. On my good days, I'm only five feet two. What good are 12-foot shelves if I can't reach the glue in today's warehouse box department stores? Up at 5 a.m., lucky to be home 5 p.m., so many different hats I wear, home and work, work and home. They cannot be compared. Why should I, after p.m. 5, too weary to frequent gym, walk the miles for exercise and jive of warehouse box department store aisles? When our civilization is past, what do you suppose future archaeologists will make of rolling green garden hose? 
What will future archaeologists think of whirligigs, flamingos pink? What ponderings will occur as future archaeologists do pour about our warehouse box department stores? Perhaps it's not too late for downtown streets called Maine. If the saying's true, what's old is new again. On my good days, I'm only five foot two. What good to me are 12 foot shelves if I can't reach the glue in today's warehouse box department stores? Thank you. Six o'clock on Saturday morning. The phone wrenches me awake. A friend's voice, hoarse with smoke, tells me that his apartment flared up in the dark. 6.23, clutching scraps from my closet. I stand at the corner beside his green house, staring at the hole where his dormer used to be. The sodden debris on the street, melted records, mattress shreds, the stink of soot. He waits for me barefoot on a neighbor's couch, huddled under a smudged brown robe, his hair singed short, fingering with his words the endless worry beads of a candle tumbled on its side by a housemate making love, of smoke too thick for a flashlight's beam to slash apart. And limping off his tongue, the litany of daily treasures that perished in the night. Not everyone is green. The greening of America needs help from you and me, because when we're not looking, someone will cut down a tree. In Western Pennsylvania, some greens lost their reserve when they learned 15 trees had been felled at a nature preserve. These friends of furry fir trees the, thought some dastardly loggers laid waste to the protected pines to spite the hated tree huggers. The infuriated greens vowed as a first resort to haul some logging company into the nearest federal court. The greens had forest rangers hunt for a logging company's cleavers but they were shocked to learn the tree choppers were some hungry beavers. Thank you very much. The first poem I'm gonna read is called Main Street in August. Two men argue shirtless on blue townhouse balconies, backs laminated with the mad sweats of August and unpaid rent. One is no excuses and all gestures, while the other slumps and twists his cherry mouth and lazy insults, the point of the finger issuing its final sentence to Baroque white storefronts as his arguments cascade off the banister into the polite ignorance of crowds. And the men grit grins and they spit teeth and their red muscles flash as they follow the magnetic pull of shouts and contradictions as air thickens and stretches its broad back between suburban sad bodies. And oh, his lips are growing new furrows. His argument wrinkles in the four o'clock dawn. And the second poem is for my mom. Modern American Poetry, 1972. When she reads, my mother underlines sentences that scratch her eyes and make her hands tremble to pen those pages. In her libraries, these phrases are dozens, yelling out of novels like street signs on highways or still wet tattoos. But in this book, there is only one word, lost. Pinched between flights of 1920s poetry and 1970s dust, while creases made by thin hands fade in margins, and all those tired rhyme schemes lose their edge. And she scores the skinny lit letters with shaky wrists because she is 21 and younger and older than woman should ever be. And while she reads, she is not thinking of Frost and Carlos Williams, but of that one, the no good one, with the hot laugh and the steel eyes and the talk that left no time for looking. Thank you. Uh, this is a song um, that was written based on uh, interviews with women um, who are breast cancer survivors, and the song is called Portrait of Hope. Mm -hmm. 
Let the sunlight fall into my eyes Let the dark clouds disappear Let the wind take my uncertainty Lift me up and soothe my fears I am a portrait of hope Let the power rise within me. Give me reason to believe and the strength to make a difference for my sisters who come after me. I am a portrait of hope. Young and old smiles Black and white, tall and short lines, looking out through one pair of eyes, one million reflections behind one dream, to be the change we want to bring. Let the warrior inside me win the battle that I face. Keep me fighting for the ones I love. And for the truth we'll find one day, I am a portrait of hope. and roses gowns with flair caress my shoulders to the skies I bear looking over my children and to my faith holding on to every holding on to every the sea I'm a fighter pilot through the storm and when I land the world will see I am a portrait of Thank you. When I came in, I noticed that there were some scones in the back, and it reminded me of my childhood. And uh, I'm sure you all know about the Lazy Susan that um, has cakes for all. Lazy Susan, it was on the far side of the plate, sitting proud, magisterial in a small child's mind giving off a beckoning hint of succulent pleasure. The eyes in my head must have been bulging, little fingers tipped with chewed up nails, eager to turn the plates one on top of the other. For nearest me were only crumbs, all the evidence left of Sunday tea and lazy Susan spinning her gifts. But there was a problem. My grandmother's stern voice and gaze stood sentry to those treats, None could leave but on her say-so, given in such a Scottish tongue. 
adults first, of course, the rule, and then the eldest child, and so on, down to me. What chance had I, the third-born child? All the men assembled would wait their turn, better, than, better that than wrath incurred from tartan tongue. Once I had the temerity to ask for another scone. It was as if the ground should eat me up and not me the buttered bun. Presbyterian guilt ripped through my heart and mute I came right there. The cakes remained in Susan's grasp, for Grandma did not care. Grown am I, and cakes abound with Susan gone for good. Come to our house and fill your plate. There's always lots of food. I recently emptied out uh, an old lockup that I'd had for a few years, keeping everything from the past, of course wondering why I kept it. And I recently wrote a poem called Old Photos. Pictures lying around, packets of the past thrown in a bag, crumpled brown bag buried in a cardboard box, locked away with others in a dingy lockup, rented by the month, cramped space. Now is time to bring those memories home, these photos, mixed with records of music, pillows and bedsheets, records of success and failure, wives and family, spectacles that were too big or seemed so as I sat and revisited my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. What is it my father said? One year of happiness, 49 years of pain. Photos lying around in the fresh air, glimpses of yesterday held forever to be handed down to the grandchildren. Will they have time to sit and look at the past? Old photos in a brown bag, in the shed, new shed, fresh wood, shingles, nails hammered in, ready to hold yesterday, for today, and tomorrow, so one day I can come to the shed and sit in the sunlight reminiscing, thinking about what was, what might have been, what is. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, this song is called Tear Down Every Wall. It's a call to unity. Um, I think we're at a place in our history as people in the world and as the American people where we are being systematically divided. Uh, somebody has reintroduced the old military maxim, divide and conquer, and they've got us at each other's throats uh, if we don't agree with one another's preferences. I don't think we have to agree with one another's preferences in order to embrace them as human beings. Uh, so it's an anti-divisional song it's a call to unity it's called Tear Down Every Wall Well now if you want to dissipate the darkness you know you've got to shine your light Tear down the walls that divide and separate us and help the blind regain their sight. We got to tear down every wall now. Children got to tear down every wall. We got to hoo early in the morning got to tear down every wall. We got war among the Christians, Muslims and Jews, war between the straight and gay. Everybody's talking about peace and understanding, something's lost in translation along the way. Now the left say the right means spirited and cold, the right say the left's unsound. Both sides are building up a walls of separation. Got to tear these walls on down. We got to tear down every wall now. Children got to tear down every wall. We got to hoo, hoo, hoo early in the 
the morning got to tear down a every wall. Jesus met the woman at the well. He asked her for a drink of water. He didn't care that she was a Samaritan. He laid the love of God on her. Now I don't mean to sound religious. I know that turns some people off. But if you don't resist the devil when it comes around, you know you're surely going to pay the cost. We got to tear down every wall now. Children got to tear down every wall. We got to early in the morning got to tear corruption everywhere some evil plan the poor victimized by the rich and powerful they think that we don't understand we got to tear down every wall now children got to tear down every wall we got to early in the morning got to tear Now, children got to tear down every wall. We got to hoo-hoo, early in the morning, got to tear down every wall. We got to tear down every wall. We got to tear down every wall. We got to tear down every wall. I wrote this a couple days ago. I read an article in the Boston Globe trying to explain, that attempted to explain why the vampire phenomenon was so big. Uh, the one uh, thesis was that uh, people wanted to, immortality, people wanted to live forever. And the, the second part was uh, people wanted to live forever at 18 years old, you know, pretty and handsome. And all that. So I wrote this, and I got it as a character for this one. Uh, it's called Rather. There doesn't seem to be a long term plan that binds a woman to a worried man who can't see past the turn in the road, so I'll just have to carry that load. Rather than my words would wound unkind, I'll just keep on loving in my mind on the chance that modern love should disappear. I suppose I'll simply love you from here. I couldn't bear to see your smile grow old the way it ends has doubtless been foretold. I'll remember you the way you are when time has traveled me so very far. For I can't hold the river by the tail or reach that far horizon from this jail. So rather than the dimming of the light, I'll just walk away without a fight. That's rather. Uh, the second one, uh, it's a Carpenter poem. We uh, just the plug for the Carpenter poets at Jamaica Plain. We have our reading next week, annual Monday after a Thanksgiving reading in Jamaica Plain. Uh, Carpenterpoets.org if you're interested. It's called Annie on the Stairs. This poem. These pine stairs were once an inch thick. Now in places they're about half of that. How they held up, I'll never understand. At first sight, I held my breath, but looks can be deceiving. I knew that outlasts me. Annie was always after me to replace them, saying, but isn't that what you do? Yes, I'd say, then quickly changed the subject. And she soon gave up her asking, for how could I explain? They were in rough shape when we bought this place. We were so young and this house so old. And after a hard day on the job in the heat, the dust and the noise, learning the ropes on icy staging in the wind, with the snow-covered ground so far below. My fingers remember it all. After chores and dinner with Annie, I'd hit those stairs and hear those familiar creaks and groans. Each stair had its own pitch and tone, like old pine piano keys on a world-weary board. I'd look forward to those sounds because I knew we made it through another hard day. After cleaning up, I'd lie in bed reading or thinking about the bills or about time, 
on what an older version of us would be like. Then I'd hear Annie on those old stairs playing her own sweet melody. I knew that the door would soon be opening and that I'd be putting to bed those old cares. The kids came and grew, and stair music went from hesitant to raucous to playful and more than once to anger. Yet, at the end of the day, I'd hear Annie on those stairs. And on those later than curfew high school nights when they thought I couldn't hear, it was that safe at home at last music that cut through my frustrations and my fear. And that's when I knew Annie knew. The kids are since gone. The stairs are still holding up, mostly. Every so often I tamp down a restless nail or two, a battle I know I'll soon lose. On those long winter nights when I feel as old as this house, I know I'll be leaving that fight for the next guy, just as long as I hear Annie on the stairs. Thank you. I'm a songwriter, but I also sometimes write spoken word, and the piece, I'm, I'm going to do this performance in two parts, and uh, the piece, the first piece I'm going to present, I've uh, performed as a song and as a spoken word piece, and this will be mostly spoken word. It's inspired uh, by something that happened. A friend of my, a very dear friend of my daughter's, uh, passed away recently from cancer, and I wanted to write some words to comfort Wendy, my daughter. It's called Keep Her Alive in You. You feel a loss, an emptiness. She's gone from your life. You wish you could see her one last time. You can't help but wonder what more you could have done. But there was nothing, and now you weep. Keep her alive in you. Keep her alive. Keep her alive in you. Her dreams live on within you. Move them forward. She lives in you, and that will always be a friend, a lover, teacher, child, it matters not. You really miss her. Don't let her go. Keep her alive in you. Keep her alive. Keep her alive in you. And when I'm gone, I hope that you will carry on for me. Take my dreams. Go on and give them life. Showing love for one another, we can make our way. Only loving brings eternal peace. Keep me alive, keep me alive in you. Thank you. And I really do keep people I care about alive in my own small way. My mother, Norma Farber, was a poet, a classical soprano. And when she became a grandmother, she wrote children's books, publishing over 20 of them in her lifetime. My very favorite book is called How Does It Feel to Be Old? and I'll just read from the first couple of pages. How does it feel to be old? Very nice. I don't have to listen to parents' advice such as watch where you step, don't slip on the ice, come in from the cold, take off your rubbers, now tie your shoe. Nobody's telling me what to do. If somebody does, I just don't hear. Do I make myself clear? I please myself, make my own choice. Sometimes I miss my mother's voice and my father's way, so tall, so grand, of taking me firmly by the hand. Nobody's telling me. All the same, I'd like to be called by my childhood name. How does it feel to be old? Quite brave, quite bold. I say what I choose, having nothing to lose by being a demon taking a chance, no punishment. 
I can afford to be mean, cranky and mean, ranting and raving. I've nothing to get, no kiss, no reward for proper behaving. I come, I go, as though, as though nobody cared if I came or went. I'll scream if I will, and still, and yet, nobody's made me cry in years. I miss the hug coming after the tears. Thank you. Threshing floor. I'm coming down to it, the core of my heart, checking the wind, winnowing chaff from grain, damned untidy process, tiny pieces floating, catching breeze, blowing away. The theory is you're left with all that's essential at the end of the process. Start by digging down to the bone. Scrape it all up into a sturdy basket. Carry it into a field and lay down a blanket to catch the good. Then pick that, blank, that basket up. Cradle the everything that you are. Raise your full arms heavenward. Say a prayer for peace and let the wind carry the hull of you away, leaving heart and soul, memory, and philosophy of love as heart would, as essence. Now pick that blanket up by its four corners, spill nothing. Take it back to the place where you live and slowly begin to put yourself back together. This restoration takes time. Measure your worth in weight, feather light. Breathe in, breathe out, begin again. I'm going to sing um, an a cappella song, which is spoken music. So we're combining both the, the musician and the poet in me. And this is a song I wrote in my father's voice, who was 84 on Monday. And he was a child of the Depression, uh, born in Arkansas, ended up in California. And he could teach us all a lot about how to be optimistic when economic times are bad. As a child, I walk this land from the Dust Bowl to the sea. And I saw trouble all around, hardship and poverty. But life can be a mountain top, life can be a canyon. Keep the Bible at your side, make laughter your companion. Give me grace, Lord, to guide my way. Give me less load to carry, for I fear the night has conquered day and I can't afford to tarry. Well, I grew tall and I grew strong and even in my youth could take the measure of a man, tell his lies from truth. I loved and wed a maiden fair, kept her with my labor. Fed and close six children was a good friend and neighbor. Give me grace, Lord, to guide my way. Give me less load to carry. For I fear the night has conquered day and I can't afford to tarry. Well, life is bitter, life is sweet. I've seen a give and take. A man cannot live for score year without a share of heartache. I've outlived a wife and child. I buried them with tears. Still, I thank the Lord above for granting me these long years. Give me grace, Lord, to guide my way. Give me less load to carry for I fear the night has conquered day and I can't afford to tarry 
And when I wake, the sun, it pours a halo around my bed. And through my window, I can see the wild hawk overhead. I know not my remaining years. The good Lord keeps me guessing. But every morning that I see, I count it God's great blessing. Give me grace, Lord. Lord, to guide my way, give me less load to carry, for I fear the night has conquered day, and I can't afford to tarry. Give me grace, Lord, to guide my way, give me less load to carry, for I fear the night has conquered day, and I can't afford to tarry. I studied this illuminated manuscript called the Roth Rothschild Canticles, and it had scriptural parts that went along with the illuminations. And the one that I focused on, or the section dealt with the Song of Songs, which is interpreted in many different ways. One is that it's an overtly sexual marriage song, uh, but Christians were a little uncomfortable with this during the Middle Ages, and they saw them as a metaphor for the relationship between God and the church. and um, But other people saw it as the relationship between a nun and her role as the bride of Christ. So I started to write these poems looking at the illuminations and tried to incorporate all of that. But what ended up happening was that they sounded like a um, narrative of a horny nun who was hot for Jesus. <laughs> so how did I resolve this problem? Um, <laughs> I cut out most of it and turned them all, these little sections, into dream sequences. And it's called the Sponza's Dream, and Sponza means bride. Dream one. While the trees swayed in their untrimmed leanings, I departed from my house, green and uncomplicated. I had not yet blossomed. In the dooryard, foxes ran asunder. Who knew they could scale vegetation? One of them carried a sprout away as if it were a revelation. It's strange, but the last thing I remember is that that bud in both color and shape resembled my cap. Dream two. Obscured like etched glass, I was unrecognizable in front of a backdrop of dehydrated sky. Three streams were saturated with multiple faces, soaked but not drowning. The scalloped clouds supported my body as I scolded the tree with the pruning knife, cultivating untamed spirits with tools. Dream three. At first, we mirrored each other like mimes. Then he became a magician and switched our garments. I remember the lines in his hands, the head between life and the heart. He told me, lay down the arms of your thoughts Go to the room with no window. I will meet you there, invisible fortress. Like light, I passed through without breakage. I entered him through his heart to his side to prove that he was human, because sometimes I felt that even he did not believe it. Dream four. I sat within the frame of an arched window of stained and sutured glass that separated his light into colors before a tall white hedge that resembled sturdy molars, I constructed a fort. But this was a false refuge. Nearby, he cleaved to his own flaming sun, then looked away. Dream five. To find him, I had to leave my small house with its small door. Until I found a structure made of turrets and partial towers a hint of a lost but holy city. As an overwrought glow of deep yellow penetrated the sky within me, he led me to pluck the yield of an unfinished crop, tinged with the pink of last minute sun. These buds were rudiments, little projections, stages of growth that had no chance to fully open. No one 
stands at my door There's a wind from the shore In the stillness I wait inside the storm And the storm waits in me I'll be gone now, you'll see And you won't have my blood to keep you warm Just one last chance Can you use what's left of me here? Cause departure fills me with fear That I will be Like the moon in the sky Like the stars in your eye I must move on before I can Just one last chance Can you use what's left of me here Because departure fills me with fear That I might be alone Like the moon in the sky Like the stars in your eye I must move on before I This is my, basically my philosophy, for better or for worse, I've decided. So, uh, this is it.
can't take it with you in the end. Hey. Smokestack black and a velvet shine light. 